tremendous serving man, and I'm simple by your name. Which way have you looked for Master Caius that calls himself Doctor of Physic? Nay, nice, sir, every way. But the town way. I most vehemently desire you, you will also look that way. I, I will, sir. Bless my soul, how full of choler am I, and trembling of mind, I shall be glad if he have deceived me. I will not his urinals about his knave's costard when I have good opportunity for the work. Yonder, he is coming. This way, Sir Hugh. Heaven prosper the right. What weapons has he? No weapons, sir. There is my master, Master Shello, and uh, another gentleman from Falkmore. Over the stile, this way. Oh now, Master Parson. Save you, good Sir Hugh. Bless you from his mercy sake, all of you. We are come to you to do a good office, Master Parson. Very well. What is it? Yonder is a most reverend gentleman who, belike having received wrong by some person, is at most odds with his own gravity and patience that ever you saw. I have lived four score years and upward. I never heard a man of his place gravity and learning so wide of his own respect. What is he? I think you know him, Master Dr. Caius, the renowned French physician. I had as lief you would tell me of a mess of porridge. <laughs> Why? He is a knave. A cowardly knave, as you would desire to be acquainted with all. I warrant you, he's the man should fight with him. It appears so by his weapons. Keep them asunder. Here comes Dr. Caius. Uh, nay, good Master Parson, keep in your weapon. So do you, good Master Doctor. Disarm them and let them question. Let them keep their limbs whole and hack our English. I pray you, let me speak a word in your ear. At wherefore will you not meet me? I will not your urinals about your knaves coxcomb for missing your meetings and appointments. Diabel, the uh, jack will be mine host, the gutter. I have not stayed for to kill him. Have I not? At the place did I appoint? As I am a Christian soul now, look you, this is the place appointed. I'll be judgment by mine host of the garter. Peace, I say. Carlia and Gull, French and Welsh, soul curer and body curer. Ah, uh, this is very good, excellent. A piece, I say. <laughs> I have deceived you both. I have directed you to wrong places. Your hearts are mighty, your skins are whole. Let the burnt sack be the issue. Come, lay your swords to pawn. Follow me, lads of peace. Trust me, a mad host. Follow, gentlemen, follow. <laughs> He has made us stop the first. Made us his laughing stock. I desire you that we may be friends and let us knot our brains together to be revenged on this scurvy companion, this host of the garter. With all my heart, uh, he promised to bring me away and page. He deceived me too. Well, I will smite his noddles. Pray or follow. <laughs> Nay, keep your way, little gallant. You were wont to be a follower, but now you are a leader. Whether had you rather led mine eyes, or I your master's heels? I'd rather, forsooth, go before you like a man than follow him like a dwarf. Oh, you are a flattering boy. Now I see you'll be a courtier. Well met, Mistress Page. Whither you go? Truly, sir, to see your wife. Is she at home? Aye, and as idle as she may hang together for want of company. I think if your husbands were dead, you two would marry. Be sure of that. Uh, where had you this uh, pretty weathercock? I cannot tell what the dickens his name is. What do you call your knight's name, Cyril? The John Falstaff. Sir John Falstaff? He! I can never hit on his name. There is such a leak between my good man and, and he. Is your wife home at, indeed? Indeed she is. 
By your leave, sir, I am sick till I see her. Mm. Has Paige any brains? Have they any eyes? Sure, where they sleep, he has no use of them. Why, this boy will carry a letter 20 mile as easy as a cannon will shoot point blank 12 score. <laughs> he pieces out his wife's inclination, he gives her folly motion and advantage, and now she's going to my wife and first off boys with her. Oh, good clots! They are laid, and our revolted wives share damnation together. Well, I will take him. Then torture my wife. Pluck from the borrowed veil of modesty from the so seeming Mistress Page, divulged Page himself for a secure and willful Actian, and to these violent proceedings all my neighbours shall cry aim. The clock gives me my cue, and my assurance bids me search. There I shall find Falstaff. I shall be rather praised for this than mocked, hmm. for it is as positive as the earth is firm that Falstaff is there. I will go. Well met, Master Ford. Oh, trust me, I have good cheer at home, and I pray you all will go with me. I must excuse myself, Master Ford. And so must I, sir. We have appointed to dine with Mistress Anne, and I would not break for her for more money than I'll speak of. We have lingered about a match between Anne Page and my cousin Slender, and this day we shall have our answer. I hope I have your good will, Father Page. You have, Master Slender. I stand wholly for you. But my wife, Master Doctor, is for you altogether. Aye. The maid loves me, my nurse. Quickly, then, tell me so much. What say you to young Master Fenton? He capers, he dances, he has the eyes of youth. He writes verses, he will carry it. Not by my consent, I promise you. The gentleman is of no having. He kept company with the wild prince. He is of too high a region, he knows too much. No, he shall not knit a knot in his fortunes with the finger of my substance. If he take her, let him take her simply. The wealth I have waits on my consent, and my consent goes not that way. I beseech you heartily, some of you go home with me to dinner. Beside your cheer, you shall have sport. I will show you a monster. Master mm -hmm. Doctor, you shall go. So shall you, Master Page. And you, so you. Well, fare you well. We shall have the freer wooing at Master Page's. Go on, John Rugby. I, I come anon. Farewell, my hearts. I will to my honest knight Falstaff and drink canary with him. I think I shall drink in pipe wine first with him. I'll make him dance. <laughs> will you go, gentles? Have with you to see this monster? Come on. <laughs> Here, set it down. Give your men the charge, we must be brief. Marry, as I told you before, John and Robert be ready here, hard, and by in the brew house. And when I suddenly call you, come forth, and without any pause or staggering, take this basket on your shoulders. That done, trudge with all haste, and empty it in the muddy ditch close by the Thames side. You will do it? I have told them over and over. They lack no direction. Be gone, and come when you are called. Here comes little Robin. How now? What news with you? My master, Sir John, is come in at your back door, Mistress Ford, and request your company. Have you been true to us? Aye, I'll be sworn. My master knows not of your being here, and hath not th threatened me to put me into everlasting liberty if I tell you of it, for he swears he'll turn me away. Thou art a good boy. This secrecy of thine shall be a tailor to thee, and shall make thee a new doublet and hose. I'll go hide me. Do so. Go tell thy master I am alone. Mistress Page, remember your cue. I warrant thee, if I do not act it, hiss me. <laughs> go then. We'll use this gross pompion. Have I caught thee? my heavenly jewel why now let me die for i have lived long enough this is the period of my ambition oh this blessed hour oh sweet sir john 
Mistress Ford, I would thy husband were dead. I'll speak it before the best lord. Oh, goodness, I would make thee my lady. <laughs> Your lady, Sir John. Alas, I shall be a pitiful lady. Thou art a traitor to say so. Thou wouldst make an absolute courtier, and the firm fixture of thy foot would give an excellent motion to thy gait in a semicircled farthingale. I see that thou wert, if fortune thy foe were not, nature thy friend, come, thou canst not hide from me. Believe me, there is no such thing in me. What made me love thee? Let that persuade thee there's something extraordinary in thee. I love thee, none but thee, and thou deserved it. Do not betray me, sir. I fear you love Mistress Page. Oh, that might as well say I love to walk by the counter gate, which is as hateful to me as the reek of a lime kiln. Well, heaven knows how I love you, and you shall one day find it. Keep that in mind. I'll deserve it. Nay, I must tell you, so you do, or else I could not be in that mind. Mistress Ford, here's Mistress Page at the door, sweating and blowing and looking wildly, and would needs speak with you presently. Oh. Mm, she shall not see me. I will encounter my health. I have the iris. Oh, pray you do so. She is a very tattling woman. What's the matter? Oh, Mistress Ford, what have you done? You're shamed. You're overthrown. You're undone forever. What's the matter, good Mistress Page? Oh, Mistress Ford, having an honest man to your husband to give him such cause of suspicion. What cause of suspicion? <laughs> what cause of suspicion? Out upon you. How am I mistook in you? Why, alas, what's the matter? Your husband's coming hither, woman, with all the officers in Windsor to search for a gentleman that he says is here now in the house by your consent. To take an ill advantage of his absence, you are undone. Tis not so, I hope. Pray heaven it be not so, but you have such a man here. But tis most certain your husband's coming, with half of Windsor at his heels, to search for such a one. I come before you to tell you. If you know yourself clear, why, I am glad of it. But if you have a friend here, convey him out. Be not amazed. Call all your senses to you. Defend your reputation, or bid farewell to your good life forever. What shall I do? There is a gentleman, my dear friend, and I fear not mind my own shame or his peril. I had rather than a thousand pounds he were out of the house. For oh, shame! Oh, how have you deceived me? Look, here is a basket. If he be of any reasonable stature, he may creep in here, throw foul linen upon him, and send him by your two men to the laundry. He's too big to go in there. What shall I do? Let me see. Uh, I'll fit in. Are these... Uh, and let me be your friend's counsel. What? Sir John Falstaff? Are these your letters, knight? I love thee. Help me away. Let me creep in here. Help to cover your master boy. Call your men, Mistress Ford. You dissembling knight. Done! Robert! Go take these clothes here quickly. Carry them to the laundress. Pray you, come near. If I suspect without cause, why then make sport at me? Then let me be your jest. I deserve it. How now? Whither bear you this? Uh, to the laundress, forsooth. <laughs> why? What have you to do with whether they bear it? You were best meddle with buck washing. Buck? I would I could wash myself of the buck. Gentlemen, I have dreamed tonight. I tell you my dream. 
here be my keys. Ascend my chambers, search, seek, and find out. I'll warrant we'll unkennel a fox. Let me this way first. Good Master Ford, be contented. You wrong yourself too much. True, Master Page. Up, gentlemen, you shall see sport anon. Follow me, gentlemen. This is very fantastical humours and jealousies. Is not the fashion of France. Nay, follow him, gentlemen. See the issue of his search. Is there not a double excellency in this? I know not what pleases me better, that my husband is deceived, or Sir John. <laughs> what a taking was he in when your husband asked who was in the basket? <laughs> I am half afraid he will have need of washing. The throwing him in the water will do him benefit. Hang him, dishonest rascal. <laughs> <clears throat> I think my husband has special suspicion of Falstaff's being here, for I never saw him so gross in jealousy till now. I will lay a plot to try that, and we will yet have more tricks with Falstaff. <laughs> Shall we send that foolish carrion mistress quickly to him, and excuse his throwing in the water, and give him another hope, to betray him to another punishment? We will do it. Let him be sent for tomorrow, eight o'clock, to have amends. I cannot find him. Maybe the knave bragged of what he could not compass. You used me well, Master Ford, do you? Aye, I do so. Heaven make you better than your thoughts. Amen. You do yourself mighty wrong, Master Ford. Aye, I must bear it. There be nobody in the house. Heaven forgive my sins at the day of judgment. There's nobody. Fie, Master Ford, are you not ashamed? What spirit, what devil suggests this imagination? I would not have your distemper in this kind for the wealth of Windsor Castle. Tis my fault, Master Page. I suffer for it. You suffer for a bad conscience. Your wife is as honest a woman as I will desire among five thousand. Uh, Tis an honest woman. Well, I promised you a dinner. Come, walk with me in the park. I pray you pardon me. I will hereafter make known to you why I have done this. Come, wife. Come, Mistress Page. I pray you pardon me. Pray heartily, pardon me. Let's go in, gentlemen, but trust me, we'll mock him. I do invite you tomorrow morning to my house to breakfast, after we'll a birding together. Shall it be so? Aye. If there is one, I shall make two in the company. If there be one or two, I shall make the third. Pray you go, Master Four Page. I pray you now, remembrance tomorrow on the lousy knave, mine host. That is good. A lousy knave to have his jibes and his mockeries. <laughs> I see I cannot get thy father's love, therefore no more turn me to him, sweet man. Alas, how then? What? Thou must be thyself. He doth object I am too great of birth, and that my state being galled with my expense, I seek to heal it only by his wealth. Besides these other bars he lays before me, my riots past, my wild societies, and tells me tis a thing impossible I should love thee, but has a property. Maybe he tells you true. No, heaven so speed me in my time to come. Albeit, I will confess thy father's wealth was the first motive that I wooed thee, and yet, wooing thee, I found thee of more value than stamps in gold or sums in sealed bags, and tis the very riches of thyself that I now aim at. Gentle Master Fenton, yet seek my father's love. Still seek it, sir. If opportunity and humblest suit cannot attain it, why then, hark you hither. Break their talk, must mistress, quickly. My kinsman shall speak for himself, be not dismayed. No, she shall not dismay me, I care not for that, but that I am afeard. Hark ye, Master Slender would speak a word with you. I come to him. This is my father's choice. Oh, what a world of vile, ill-favoured faults. Looks handsome in three hundred pounds a year. And how does good Master Fenton? 
Uh, would speak a word with you? She's coming to her cars. Mistress Anne, my cousin loves you. Aye, that I do. As well as I love any woman in Gloucestershire. He will maintain you like a gentlewoman. Aye, that I will. He will make you a hundred and fifty pounds jointure. Good Master Shallow, let him woo for himself. She calls you cars. I'll leave you. Now, Master Slender. Uh, now, good Mistress Anne. What is your will? What would you with me? Uh, truly, for my own part, I would little or nothing with you. Your father and my uncle have made motions. They can tell you how things go better than I can. You may ask your father. Here he comes. Now, Master Slender, love him, daughter Anne. Why, how now? What does Master Fenton hear? You wrong me, sir, thus still to haunt my house. I told you, sir, my daughter is disposed of. Nay, Master Page, be not impatient. Good Master Fenton, come not to my child. She is no match for you. Sir, will you hear me? No, good Master Fenton. Come, Master Shallow. Come, son Slender, in. Knowing my mind, you wrong me, Master Fenton. Speak to Mistress Page. Good Mistress Page, for that I love your daughter in such a righteous fashion as I do, perforce against all checks, rebukes and manners, I must advance the colours of my love and not retire. Let me have your goodwill. Good mother, do not marry me to yon fool. I mean it not. I seek you a better husband. That's my master, Master Doctor. <laughs> Alas, I had rather be set quick in the earth and bowled to death with turnips. Come, trouble not yourself. Good Master Fenton, I will not be your friend nor enemy. My daughter will I question how she loves you, and as I find her, so am I affected. Till then, farewell, sir. She must needs go in. Her father will be angry. Farewell, gentle mistress. Farewell, ma'am. <sighs> This is my doing now. Nay, said I, will you cast away your child on a fool and a physician? Look on, Master Fenton, this is my doing. I, I thank thee, and I pray thee once tonight, give my sweet Nan this ring. There's for thy pains. Now heaven send thee good fortune, a kind heart he hath. A woman would run through fire and water for such a kind heart. But yet I would my master had Mistress Anne. Or I would Master Slender had her. Oh, or in sooth I would Master Fenton had her. Oh, I will do what I can for them all three. For so I have promised and I will be as good as my word. But speciously for Master Fenton. <laughs> well, I, I must have another errand to Sir John Falstar from my two mistresses. What a beast am I to slack it. <laughs> Bardolph, I say. Here, sir. Go fetch me a quart of sack. Have I lived to be carried in a basket like a barrel of butcher's offal and to be thrown into the Thames? The rogues slighted me into the river with as little remorse as they would have drowned a blind bitch's puppies. <laughs> and you may know by my size that I have a kind of alacrity in sinking. If the bottom were as deep as hell, I should down. I had been drowned, but that the shore was shelvy and shallow, a death that I abhor, for the water swells a man. And what a thing should I have been when I've been swelled. <laughs> I should have been a mountain. <laughs> Here's Mistress Quickly, sir, to speak with you. Let me pour in some sack into the Thames water, for my belly's as cold as if I'd swallowed snowballs. <laughs> Mary, sir, I come to your worship from Mistress Ford. Mistress Ford? Mm -hmm. I've had Ford enough. I was thrown into the Ford. I've had my belly of Ford. Alas, the day. Good heart, that was not her fault. <laughs> she does so take on with her men, they mistook their erection. <laughs> so did I mine. So build upon a foolish woman's promise. Well, she laments, sir, for it, that it would yearn your heart to see it. Her husband goes this morning a birding. She desires you once more to come to her between eight 
and nine. I must carry her word quickly. She'll make you amends, I warrant you. Well, I will visit her. Tell her so, and bid her think what a man is. Let her consider his frailty, and then judge me of my merit. I will tell her. Do so, between nine and ten, sayest you? Uh, eight and nine, sir. Ah, okay. <clears throat> eight and nine. Well, be gone, I will not miss her. But peace be with you, sir. <laughs> I marvel I hear not of Master Brook. He sent me word to stay within. I like his money well. Now, oh, here he comes. Bless you, sir. Now, Master Brook, you come to know what hath passed between me and Ford's wife? That indeed, Sir John, is my business. Master Brook, I will not lie to you. I was at her house the hour she appointed me. And spied you, sir? Very ill-favouredly, Master Brooke. How so, sir? Did she change her determination? No, Master Brooke, but her husband, dwelling in a continual alarm of jealousy, comes to me in the instant of our encounter, after we had embraced, kissed, protested, and, as it were, spoke the prolude of our comedy, and at his heels a rabble of his companions, thither provoked and investigated by his distemper, and forsooth to search his house for his wife's love. What? While you were there? While I was there. And did he search for you? I, I could not find you? You shall hear, as good luck would have it, comes in one mistress page, gives intelligence of Ford's approach. And in her intervention and Ford wife's distraction, they conveyed me into a basket. <laughs> Skit! A basket! <laughs> Rammed me in with four shirts, smocks, socks, foul stockings, greasy napkins. Master Brook, there was the rankest compound of vigilant, of villainous smell that could have, have ever offended the nostril. And how long? Lay you there? Nay, you shall hear, Master Brook, that I have suffered to bring this woman to evil for your good. Mm. Thus, being crammed in the basket, a couple of Ford's knaves, his hinds, they called forth by their mistress to carry me. In the name of foul clothes to Datchet Lane. Oh. They took me to their shoulders, met what they had in their basket, I quaked for fear, lest the lunatic knave would have searched it, but fate, ordaining he should be a cuckold, held his hand. Well, on went for he for the search, and away went I for foul clothes. But first, as intolerable fright to be detected next, to be compassed in the circumference of the peck, hilt to point, hail to head, and then to be stopped in, like a strong distillation, with stinking clothes that fretted in their own grease. Think of that. Oh and a man of my kidney, think of that. And I'm subject to heat as a butter. A man of continual dissolution to thaw. It was miracle to escape suff suffocation. Oh. And in the height of this bath, when I was more than half strewed in grease like a Dutch dish, to be thrown into the Thames and cooled, glowing hot, in that surge like a horseshoe. Think of that, hissing hot. Think of that, Master Brook. In good sadness, I am sorry that, for my sake, you have suffered all this. My, my soup then is desperate. Um, you'll undertake it no more? Master Brook, I will be thrown into Etna as I have been thrown into the Thames, ere I will leave her thus. Her husband is this morning going a bird watching. I have received from her another embassy of meeting, twixt eight and nine in the hour, Master Brook. Tis past eight already, sir. Is it? Well, I will then address to my appointment. Come to me at your convenient leisure, and you shall know how I speed and the conclusion shall be crowned with your enjoying her. Adieu, you shall have her, Master Brooke. 
You shall cuckold four. <laughs> I will take now the lecture. He is at my house. He cannot escape me. It is impossible he should. He cannot creep into a hairpenny purse, nor into a pepper box, but lest the devil that guiles him should aid him, I will search impossible places. If I have the horns to make one mad, oh, let the proverb go with me. I'll be horn mad. <laughs>